started to introduce myself, uh, Dr. Amy Ashley. I teach uh, at the English department, and uh, it is my great pleasure to be with you today. So, uh, uh, to our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, so a very well, a warm welcome. Uh, I feel extremely glad to welcome everyone to this third day of uh, the annual International Transdisciplinary Conference Revisiting Hybridity in Text and Context. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to be standing in front of you today uh, amongst, our, amongst our, our esteemed um, academics, professors and students. And before we uh, kickstart the conference, I would like to express my gratitude towards you all who sincerely contributed to, the, uh, to this event in, in order to make it a success. My sincere gratitude goes particularly to Professor uh, Limon Meliti, whose hard-working devotion and uh, leadership uh, have uh, been to us at the English department a real inspiration. Um, most of all, the conference uh, is and is still uh, an opportune time to renew contacts and discuss new perspectives on different themes. And I must say that all of them have been um, insightful so far. Uh, the agenda of the conference has indeed covered a wide range of interesting themes, and the papers uh, that have been presented uh, during the last two days uh, were ultimately um, insightful. So I would like to remind you very briefly about uh, a number of uh, uh, yesterday's uh, papers uh, that covered uh, that. So, population hybridity and post-humanism in the Moore's last side and the uh, English patient. Uh, rethink the civilization history, uh, nexus challenges and perspectives, the shape of flying body and the head of, of a man, our needs, poetics and politics of masters, mongers and demons. Uh, also, uh, uh, so, Ahlem Ahlemajoub, culinary metaphors, reclaimed Arab Americans, American hybridity in Diana Abu Jabir's land, the language of Baghdad, uh, language, uh, Khalid Blavri, language context and source of linguistic hybridity case of study, case study of Algerian dialectal, dialectal uh, Arabic. Uh, then uh, from purity to hybridity, late 19th century Irish nationalism as case study, uh, creating new identities and new homes and mornings in Jane uh, Crescent. Uh, so that was that was briefly a list of uh, uh, the papers covered yesterday. Um, so I would like now to introduce uh, Madame Hish of the uh, professor, sorry, Hajar Ben uh, will be uh, in, in a keynote speech. Uh, and I would like to introduce her. It is my uh, honor to introduce uh, Professor Ben Riz, who is an associate professor at the University of Tunis. Her research centers on post colonial and gender studies. She has translated several poems by Tunisian poets like Zrail uh, Ouled Ahmed, Adam Batri, and Ale Amel Moussa. She edited mobilizing narratives, uh, narrating injustices of uh, on, uh, immobility. Uh, so uh, this is it. Uh, this is all from my side. And thank you for uh, being uh, such patient listeners. I, um, I would like to call then upon uh, our distinguished guests to share their, uh, their uh, presentations and their papers. Uh, thank you, and I hope that you all, all of you enjoy your day. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like, first of all, to thank uh, Dr. Meliti, who engineered uh, this uh, very successful event. Thank you very much for your donations and your work. Also, Professor Adrian Vitti, who is absent today, uh, uh, many thanks for his generosity and for supporting the English department and all other departments, as a matter of fact. Um, a 
local regulations again and again for uh, the uh, rehabilitation of the MA uh, program and best wishes for uh, I mean, future academic achievements in this uh, faculty. So today I'm going to speak about uh, one of the most uh, famous and celebrated uh, Tunisian poets, uh, Evan Paki. And uh, please uh, let me start with so, okay, these are the two uh, first um, quotes. Following the intention, poetry is founded on four elements, word, rhythm, meaning, and rhyme. These are the boundaries of poetry. Uh, uh, a quote by Ibn Rashid al from his book, Alauda. A second quote, poetry is multiple, even though some people think of it as one-dimensional. It's openness, not what some perceive as exclusion, a quest, not certainty, emancipation, not pages and stores. These two statements testify to a long wrangle over the essence of poetry which hasn't been solved yet. Both are grounded in a Tunisian context. The first dates back to the 5th um, century of Hijri, the second is contemporary. Um, why, uh, so uh, combined, the two epigraphs testify to a long and solid poetic uh, tradition in Tunisia. Why the Yunashi insists on those four aspects? And in fact, he advocates liberating poetry from all forms of control and regimentation. Yet, Ibn Rashid's striking use of the word intention and media complicates his otherwise clear and straightforward definition. It associates writing poetry to one basic rule in Islamic practices and rituals, which precedes prayer, uh, fasting in Ramadan, or going to Mecca, or going uh, and pilgrimage to Mecca. The two quotes intersect, albeit in a broad sense, uh, in their attempts both to define and resist a definition for poetry. Ibn Rashid's outwardly rigid definition based on four pillars, namely word, rhythm, meaning, and rhyme, is undermined from the outset by imposing intention and media <coughs> as the first condition for producing poetry. In other words, one can follow these principles to the letter, but if they don't intend their text to be a part, then a part, then it will never be. What happens then if a part sticks only to media, which is a prerequisite condition for poetry, and provide a text uh, free of any limiting constraints? If, if Ibn Rashid couldn't envision such a mode of writing poetry, and in fact he defies definitions altogether. Ibn Rashid's niya, together with the word boundaries, which is evocative of the phrase Tilta Qudurullah uh, from Surah Al-Baqarah, is based on religious dogma and figuratively presupposes a poetic deity, a god whose genre commandments all poets must observe. But his description, on the other hand, marks a hubristic moment, a deliberate subversion, subversion of any code of poetic belief. This takes us to the chief idea of this paper, the hybrid quality and fact-based poetry. How you may ask. One of the relevant derivations of the hybrid is its etymological connection to the word uh, hubris from the Greek uh, hybris, originally designating presumption towards the gods. This sets the tone for my subsequent catastrophic and rather metaphorical uh, views of hybridity. If, uh, if Adam, back to the Genesis, didn't follow God's order to keep away from the forbidden fruit, Adam, the poet, shows a similar insubordination vis-à-vis the -vis doctrinaire vision of poetry and disobeys the laws of the genre in the diverse phrasing. 
The rationale behind this paper is to examine the generic complexity and practice yoga while pressing the cultural, the cultural borders of the term hybridity to the field of genre studies, I argue that hybridity in NFM is yoga is an action, an event, and a way of being. Uh, this paper is divided into three parts. First, who is a friend of hybridity? The second, Adam and poetics of a hybrid. And third, the blind glass door between and beyond uh, genres. So, who is a friend of hybridity? Hybridity is a Cartesian term that yields not only disparate definitions but also provokes diverse responses. Originally used in biology and botany to refer to offspring of plants or animals of different varieties or species, it has evolved into an umbrella term that encompasses a broad array of applications ranging from mechanics to uh, education. Its Latin etymology, hybrida, variant of hybrida, mongro, was appropriated by colonial and national discourses to promote racial and racist agendas. Even though the term is indicated uh, by post-colonial theory as a set of resistance and subversion of racial impurity, the hybrid is still regarded as the locus of fear and anxiety. Bringing hybridity to the field of the genre studies is no less problematic. The two terms are not only opposite, but also antithetical. The phrase hybrid genre is an oxymoron as hybridity, which means mixing, combining, or blending, is diametrically opposed to genre, which is a hallmark of purity. In the realm of literature, the word genre carries unmistakable associations of authority and pedantry, and commands control and regimentation. Indeed, <coughs> and I quote uh, David here, <coughs> As soon as genre announces itself, one must respect the norm, one must not cross a line of demarcation, one must not risk impurity, anomaly, or monstrosity. Put differently, as soon as a genre announces itself, hybridity must eclipse. Its threatening presence is associated with degeneration and debasement. In the field of genre studies, Hybridization refers to acts of combining, fusing, or mixing. David Duff defines it as the process by which two or more genres combine to form a new genre or subgenre, or by which elements of two or more genres are combined in a single word. While accurately describing the process, Duff's definition is careful to provide two different byproducts of this operation. It might lead to the creation of a new genre or subgenre, or it can simply result in a harmonious coexistence of different genres. His use of the word combination, however, is likely to elicit criticism of the notion of hybridity, which is based on the logic of amalgamation of a fusion at some elementary level, uh, while overlooking uh, multiplicity, which is premise of concurrence. Alan Martina, for instance, proposes to substitute the term uh, hybridity in genre studies for genre blending. Other terms which investigate mixing or combining processes may provide more intriguing alternatives. Levi Strauss' concept of bricolage offers a good example of assembling, adapting, and transforming. Bricolage, which was originally used in um, anthropology to describe the process of myth-making, is interestingly extended to acts of writing. As it operates within a pick and mix methodology, Bricolage is capable of infinite extension because basic elements can be used in a variety of improvised combinations to generate new meanings and uh, within them. Another term for mixture, uh, which uh, also gained a wide circulation in anthropology, is syncretism. This concept, which first designated religious mixture 
through the unification of the various Protestant denominations and ultimate reunion with the, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, refers to cultural borrowing and interpenetration. Now, let me provide um, a working definition of hybridity which explains the way I will use this concept in my subsequent analysis. I call hybridity any mode of mixing disparate elements, genres, themes, languages, dialects, etc. It's first and foremost an act of resistance, a war machine in the losers and Vedantis phrasing against the genre apparatus. A hybrid genre is nomadic. It progresses in the intermezzo, always in the middle, between things, into the end. It's a mobile genre. It resists closure, stasis, and sedentariness. I pursue in this paper a metaphorical dimension of the hybrid, one that pays attention to border crossings, crossroads, and conjunctions. A hybrid genre is primarily a genre in motion. Uh, I move to uh, the second part, Adam and Poetics of the Hybrid. The poet's name is intricately bound to hybridity in its dynamic sense of ontological and aesthetic mobility. Indeed, Adam Fakhi is the pen name of Fakhi Gesli, his official name of his official documents. Since his boyhood, the poet has been preoccupied by the idea of a change and movement. Because of his father's job as a, as a primary school principal, the entire family had to move from village to village. Uh, and put here from um, uh, an interview I conducted with Adam Fathir. It is not published yet. Hopefully, it will be published uh, soon. So he says, this permanent nomadic condition has reconciled me early with the idea of rootedness in change, dwelling in a labyrinth, and transforming roots into wings while preserving a mobile identity open on the universe. This vision of life is tightly linked to his creative project. Quote again, I realized early on that writing is an act of liberation by a language. The poet, like Adam, learns all the names and then starts renaming everything the way he wishes in order to recreate his world. I found it natural to start recreating myself by choosing my own name rather than accepting a name chosen by somebody else. And thus, Adam Fathi, a mixture of two names, was born. A new uh, then a uh, uh, new birth grounded in an act of bricolage, which he describes as originative transformation. Fethi, with its root Fethi-ha, is the root that opens on today and tomorrow, whereas Adam, Adam is the wing that sprouts from the roots. And this name he stipulates, i quote again, doesn't stem from, from a given meaning. It rather earns its significance from its progress. It's both local and global, insider and outsider, sedentary and nomadic, static and changeable, a citizen and an exile. Adam is probably the first exile in the belief of the cosmologic myth. This is how I perceive both myself and the poet. This ability to accommodate one thing and its opposite and to celebrate an in-between state is central to my, initial, to my initial argument, which conceives of hybridity as an act and a way of being. That his poem, the sad provision, or Mahunet um, Aliex, is probably the best illustration of this idea. And I'm going to quote, uh, to read uh, I mean in Arabic, so I provided the, uh, the translation, but it's much more beautiful in Arabic. Uh, then this is from uh, the blind glass door, Mahunet Aliex. Akhtaru min wahidin anta wa akhalu. إنها بكثرتك يا واهل 
أقل من واحد أنت وأكثر انتقد بقلتك يا عقود أضعف من هذا أنت وأقوى تقف على التخوم تحفى على الحافة أقوى من هذا أنت وأضعف تتواضع لذباب الحالات تتعالى على كلاب العسل Adam the man who is driven by an urge to be neither nor mirrors Adam the poet who refuses generic compartmentalization. The freedom to move between genres and cut his yubra upsets claims of generic categorization. A general overview of his poetic production shows a hybrid corpus that confirms through Bakhtin's definition of hybridity. What we are calling a hybrid construction is an utterance that belongs by its grammatical and a compositional models to a single speaker, but that actually contains mixed with an end two utterances, two speech manners, two styles, two languages, two semantic and axiological belief systems. From this perspective, uh, then, uh, Elefaki's work is a hybrid ensemble of songs written in a standard Arabic and Venetian dialect, long epics and short poems, and free verse and prose poetry. <coughs> right from the onset of his poetic career, Elefaki has refused rigid generic lines. He is probably the unique Arab poet who, who has used the phrase Kitab Shari, Shari, poetic book, to refer to his collections of poems. The label encapsulates the hybrid essence, essence of his creative production within an, ox, within an oxymoron unifying acts of writing. What is also specific to his poetic experience is that all these poetic books <coughs> operate within aesthetic and thematic uh, continuum connections. His first book, Sabatu Akman al Haris al published in 1982, uh, seven moons for uh, the Citadel uh, Guardian, was followed by the song of the eloquent Yununes, of Nia Kunakabi Pasih, 1986, and an Ejid on Izahat al Bubar, Anthems for the Dust Rose, in 1991. Written in a hybrid form, amalgamating three verse and prose poetry, Seven Moons narrates the story of Yasar and Adam who embark on a journey um, or on a quest for something they cannot define. On their way, they find seven moons. Um, one day they arrive at a mysterious citadel guarded by a woman called Khadra. Uh, they entreat her to allow them in, uh, and then she, uh, which she uh, accepts uh, on one condition, they give her their seven moons. Once inside, they realize that all they have been looking for are those moons. In that moment, when failure and wisdom intercept, the two men merge into one person, Yasergum. Uh, when Yasergum attempts to leave the citadel, Khadra transforms him into an explosive body, like, well, she gave him a leg made of fire and a leg made of sulfur, then she said, speak. Yasadam is unable to speak, uh, of course, because the moment he's going to speak and uh, his lips touch, he is going to explode. The song of the eloquent unionist, a 32-page chapbook, is a sequel to Seven Moons, in the sense that Yasadam, and in fact his alter ego, decides to speak. The book is a kamikaze venture. Instead of the oblique political allegory in the first book, which insinuates more than indicates, Adam Fatki writes in a clearer <coughs> and more straight, straightforward way. Metaphorical spaces are transformed into real fake places, and Tunisia emerges as the speaker's passion and quest. Soon after its publication, uh, the book was censored and banned from circulation or reprint. And Adam Fatki was, uh, uh, I mean, very much uh, harassed uh, at that time. Uh, nine years later, Adam Fatki published Anthems for the Last Rose. While similar to Seven Moons in its strategy of obfuscating generic lines by removing any genre indication on the book's cover, it carries on the suicidal mission of Anna Marie Passier. The book is composed of 13 poems written in three verse. Uh, a system which uses as a metric unit the foot at the failure, 
instead of the two hemistech uh, and weight. The tasks raise ontological, political, and aesthetic questions related to the role of thoughts, uh, and, thoughts and poetry. Political anxieties dominate the whole book and reach momentum in Anthem of Life, on, uh, then uh, Nashid of Hayat, a strikingly bold poem which doesn't hide behind metaphors or symbols and ironically confronts the oppressive regime. Ya Taira Bed the Pal Kulli. Aina Sahibuka al Kadimu, wa Aina Raha Jawedu al Mutanatio. Ya Taira Bed the Pal Kulli. But the Luhu Bisaratel, Severishu Sahataha, what Amdi, Amu was Sergio al Kadimu, Mujadda than Leo. The pretentious horse refers to the statue of former president Hibi Bourguiba, which was exchanged with a clock, with a clock after the 7th uh, of November 1987 and the ascension of Zina Habibi bin Ali to power. Surprisingly enough, the book wasn't censored. While it's difficult to explain why the regime at that time kept a blind eye to this book, one can, can speculate that the censor deemed it somewhat risky, probably, to ban anthems only two months after banning one of Eden Fatih's most famous and celebrated uh, poems, Mu'alaqatu al-Quds fi Kafi Ba'tid, which was uh, uh, censored in March 1991. In order for his poetry to circumvent the, censor, the, the censored scissors and survive, he had to adopt a hybrid type of poetry uh, to then uh, 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 a hybrid type of uh, publication, sorry. Indeed, two of his poetic books, Mu'alaq al Quds and uh, Hamel al published in 18, uh, 1984, circulated as audio texts recorded on cassettes. And that was quite innovative at, at that time that um, uh, Adam Fatke could secure uh, a reasonable circulation without censorship at that time. So I move to the third and the last part, the blind uh, glass blower between and beyond the genres. Published in 2011, uh, the blind glass blower uh, received the, the 2012 Abu Qasim uh, Prize. Uh, the genre indication at the bottom of the cover, printed in small characters and highlighted in blue, you can see it there, sharp. Uh, is most likely the publisher's attempt to impose generic discipline. The threshold of the text turns into a contact zone, a competing space where in the title written in very, very large characters, the blind glass door and red, his days and words in black, dominates the space of the color while displacing the genre indication in a marginal position. This visual confrontation translates Adam Fakhi's fight against generic regimentation, a stand he fully liberates through the exclusive use of prose poetry. This type of writing, however, presents a genre trouble which has hitherto engaged heated debates around the essence of poetry. Uh, uh, prose poetry, Hasidot al in Arabic, the literary genre with an, oxym with an oxymoron of or a name in a, 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 a Hikata's words, or the oxymoronic monster in Michel Bourgeois' uh, phrasing, has been raising interrogations and doubts ever since its inception in the 19th century by Charles Baudelaire. In a famous spleen published in 1869, Baudelaire tries to concretize his dream of a miraculous form. He describes uh, then uh, as a poetic prose, musical without rhythm or rhyme, supple and choppy enough to accommodate the lyrical movement of the soul, the undulations of the reverie, the bump and verge of the consciousness. His worst fears that people would describe this flexible, snake-like form as having neither head nor tail, have, uh, however, were realized as prose poetry is often classified as mongrel literary creature. The term hybrid is frequently used to delineate it. On the Arabic poetic scene, the situation hasn't been less tense. The term prose poem, Hasidat al which uh, started circulating by the late 1950s, was promoted by Majalat al-Shah, the Shah magazine founded by Yusuf Khan and Adonis. The contested form